Well, for one thing, the word neurodiversity is still relatively new, and there's no more dramatic demonstration of that than the fact that the title of my book in England is Neurotribes, the Legacy of Autism and How to Think Smarter About People Who Think Differently, which is an incredibly cumbersome title. But the reason why it doesn't say neurodiversity is because nobody at the publisher had ever heard that word. April is Autism Acceptance Month, and we're bringing you a slate of new perspectives and revisiting some important conversations, like this one from Steve Silverman. Steve is the author of one of the more noteworthy and groundbreaking books on autism, Neurotribes, The Legacy of Autism and the Future of Neurodiversity. This month, we welcome the world to our mission to bring awareness and acceptance to autism as we work to eliminate the stigma surrounding it. Episode 119 is straight ahead. I'm Emily Kircher Morris, and this is the Neurodiversity Podcast. What is neurodiversity? You see the world differently. Autism spectrum. Gifted. Complexities that are inherently inside. ADHD. Dysgraphia. Tourette's. All brains are different. You are exactly what this world needs. This is the Neurodiversity Podcast. Today is day one of the five day Bright and Quirky Summit 2022. I'm proud to join with a large panel of experts as we present information and ideas that will help you support bright neurodivergent children so that they can live their best lives. It's free to join us now through April 8th, and you can find a link in the show notes of this episode or on our website, neurodiversitypodcast.com. It's going on now, so get registered and join us. You're listening to the Neurodiversity Podcast. Today's guest is the author of the landmark book, Neurotribes, The Legacy of Autism and the Future of Neurodiversity. Steve Silberman, we appreciate you joining us. Thank you. I'm very honored to be here. I know you've probably told your story a million times, but for those of us who may not be familiar with your work, can you tell us what led you to write Neurotribes? So back in the year 2001, I was a science writer for Wired Magazine, and I noticed that uh, a lot of the people who I would speak to in Silicon Valley were, you know, very, very focused on their work, uh, did not necessarily have the most graceful social skills. There was a sort of prevalent, you know, stereotype of programmers as socially awkward, et cetera. Uh, and then in quick succession, I interviewed two uh, people from prominent technologically accomplished families in Silicon Valley who had autistic children. And autism, even though everyone forgets this, uh, back then, uh, just as recently as 2000, 2001, was considered very, very rare. And so I thought it was a very odd coincidence that uh, these two technologically adept families both had autistic kids in them. And I was telling that story to a friend of mine in a cafe in San Francisco where I live, and a woman at the next table said, oh, my God do you realize what's going on? There's an epidemic of autism in Silicon Valley. And so, you know, I sort of heard chords of doom, you know, and everything. Uh, but I'm also, a, I was also a science writer. So I was curious to see if she was being accurate. And what I found was that, you know, vaccines did not have anything to do with autism. There was not an epidemic of autism being caused by, you know, silicon chips or anything like, or screen time or anything like that. What I found was that the same genetics that contributed to autism seemed to contribute to certain advantages in the tech industry. For example, um, one uh, product manager from Microsoft wrote to me and said, all my best software debuggers have Asperger's syndrome. They see the code in their minds as a visual pattern, and they look for the breaks in the pattern, and that's where the bugs are. And so I started to think about autism in a different way than the kind of medicalized, pathologized, it's a syndrome, it's a disorder, it's a, you know, it's an epidemic, which it wasn't. Uh, and I started to wonder, why don't we know more about what seemed to be causing an astonishing rise in autism diagnoses. Uh, and why didn't we know 
why there seem to be a lot of autism in high-tech communities like Silicon Valley and other places in the world. And so I started pursuing that. And the more that I dug into it, the more that I decided that one of the problems was that a lot of really important truths about the discovery of autism had been either forgotten or were never known or had been deliberately buried uh, by the people involved. And so I started a long research process that culminated in the publication of Neurotribes in 2015. As you told that story of your experiences in Silicon Valley, it reminded me of my earlier days of teaching before I became a psychotherapist. I remember the school counselor coming into me one day and she said, there's a student in your class who I think has something I just heard about called Asperger's syndrome. And she was the school counselor. Oh, wow. (laughs) And that was like 2001. And it reminded me of just how much has changed in a pretty short amount of time. Well, for one thing, the word neurodiversity is still relatively new. And there's no more dramatic... uh, you know, demonstration of that than the fact that the title of my book in England is uh, Neurotribes, The Legacy of Autism and How to Think Smarter About People Who Think Differently, which is an incredibly cumbersome title. But the reason why it doesn't say neurodiversity is because nobody at the publisher had ever heard that word. And I, I begged them, I said, they will hear about it. You know, please use the title that we're using in America. They did not. Yeah. But now, of course, a lot of people know about the concept. And and really what the concept is, is a shift away from uh, the medicalizing and pathologizing jargon. Uh, Neurodiversity, in its most basic sense, is just the recognition that people have different kinds of minds that work differently, like different operating systems and computers, and um, they don't necessarily fall into a superior or inferior uh, rank. Um, Different types of minds take different approaches to solving problems and to expressing themselves and to engaging in uh, creative processes. And so rather than demonizing certain kinds of minds as, oh, that's a disease or a disorder, it's a recognition that diversity of human minds in a human community is a good thing, like biodiversity in a community of living things in, say, a rainforest is a good thing that helps that community prevail against sort of unpredictably changing conditions. And, you know, if the last year hasn't has taught us anything, it's that we can't always predict the future. And uh, we need different kinds of minds taking different approaches working together to solve enormous problems like climate change uh, or like COVID-19. In fact, as I said earlier, I think the first time I heard the word neurodiversity was when your book was published. Yeah. What are some of the other changes that you've noticed in how people are perceiving neurodiversity and autism? One of the biggest changes is that the societal conversation about autism uh, for most of the 20th century was behind the backs of autistic people. And there was, a, there was a, a very good reason for that. Adults could not get an autism diagnosis uh, in most places until the 1990s. It wasn't even considered an adult condition. People would always, you know, if you saw a picture of autistic people on a, on a charity website, it would always be children. And in fact, it would always be sort of sad looking children, like looking at the world through a foggy piece of glass or something like that, or, you know, with puzzle pieces missing, et cetera. Now we understand that that diversity is actually a strength, uh, in, uh, society and in human communities can be a strength, uh, even in a company. So that the Harvard Business Review a couple of years ago ran a front page article. You know, Harvard Business Review is like when big capitalism gets serious about something, it goes to the Harvard Business Review. And the Harvard Business Review talked about how hiring people with conditions like autism, dyslexia, and ADHD is not just being nice. It's not just about charity, but it actually helps build company value for stockholders. And so one of the wonderful things that's happening is that huge companies uh, like the German software uh, giant SAP 
is realizing that having autistic people and other neurodivergent people on the team is actually good for your business. It's not just good for your soul or good for the autistic people. or something. It's good for your business. And that's a huge change. We've gone from, you know, when I started researching autism for neurotribes, autism was considered nothing but a disorder and nothing but a set of deficits and dysfunctions. And now we understand that autism can convey competitive advantages or advantages in art or music or uh, uh, technology, science, um, as well as conveying challenges in the social world. One of the biggest struggles that autistic people face, especially you mentioned like in the workplace, is the lack of accommodations. Yes. It's the fact that the environment doesn't fit them. The environment doesn't fit them in the classroom. The environment doesn't fit them in the workplace. So they have a hard time navigating the world. Right. But really, people are starting to understand now that we can't limit potential of neurodiverse people just because their brains work differently. And, you know, think uh, the, the, the biggest thing that I realized in the course of writing Neurotribes was to, th instead of thinking about aut autism as like a baffling enigma, as it's often described, or a mysterious plague, like that woman thought in the cafe who said that to me, um, think of it as a disability. Society does have useful models for disability. For example, if you live in a wheelchair in a town that does not have accessible bathrooms, that does not have accessible uh, public buildings, that does not have accessible classrooms, you are screwed, basically. You can't go anywhere. You are, as they used to say, wheelchair bound. But if you live in a town that has all of those things, you can go anywhere. You can basically get the best chance for you to succeed as you are with or without a wheelchair. And we have to start thinking of uh, neurodivergent conditions like dyslexia, ADHD, and autism as just another form of disability that we can accommodate. And we can do that. For instance, some uh, people with these conditions are visual learners. Then the curriculum can be presented in a way that plays to their strengths, whereas some others are auditory learners. Then the curriculum can be presented in those forms. And, you know, the accommodations in the workplace uh, for autistic people, first we have to talk about how can we get autistic people into the workplace. And uh, unemployment, as many people know, is a terrible problem for autistic adults. And while I was writing Neurotribes, I spoke to many, many people who told me that they had never had a job because they'd never been able to get through a face-to-face -face interview. And if you think about the usual kind of pro tips for a face-to-face -face interview, it's it's a list of things like make a, you know, give a strong handshake, good eye contact, sell yourself. You know, these are all things that are really difficult for autistic people to do, many of them. And so we have to reform our, not just the way that we do interviews and onboarding processes for companies, but we have to get beyond a value that is very, very prevalent and almost kind of unconsidered or unconscious in Silicon Valley, which is if you ask, you know, young entrepreneurs what kind of employees they want, they say, we want team players. We want people who are like us. But the virtue of having neurodivergent employees is that they are often not team players and they see problems from different angles and can suggest criticisms or approaches that a neurotypical person would not suggest. And that's a really profound thing. It also even is something that we need to think about when we think about race in hiring. You know, instead of thinking about, oh, people like us, which is usually white guys, you know, we have to think about the values of having different perspectives. And that's one of the great gifts of neurodiversity to the future of industries like technology and science and um uh, lots of different areas of life. I think whether it's the workplace or the classroom, or even if it's at home with parents, there's a lot of contextualizing with the history that you talked about and how we're kind of trying to overcome a lot of that stigma that's still there. Right. What do you think are, is some of the 
value for individuals who maybe are not neurodivergent themselves or perhaps are to understand that history about autism? Well, oftentimes um, people are frightened by autism, Mm -hmm. particularly if, you know, if their own child has just been diagnosed, they will often hear from alleged professionals that the potential of their child is very limited or that, uh, you know, the child will be a a source of great worry and, you know, will not be able to love them back, et cetera. Those are myths. The notion that autistic people only care about themselves is a myth from the 1930s and 40s, which I talk about in the book. And these ideas have become very toxic over the years. There, you know, there was a conception that autistic people lack empathy. Well, in fact, some autistic people, you know, some autistic people do lack empathy, like some neurotypical people. One of the things that we need to do is talk about the strengths of being neurodivergent. And uh, one of the things that I stress a lot is that individualized education plans, which I'm sure, Emily, you're very familiar with. Mm -hmm. Um, It's something that, you know, teachers and parents and the school system come up with uh, so that the child can get the best chance of a good education. They often dwell only on the shortcomings of the child or the alleged deficits or impairments that the child is struggling with. We also need to focus on strengths and interests. Uh, Because one of the things that I excavated from the history of autism is that the notion that autistic interests, which do tend to be very intense and focused, uh, that that's an impairment or, you know, a, a, a shortcoming, that's wrong. That's how autistic people learn. And so by feeding the so-called obsessive interests of autistic children, that gives them a platform Uh, to be authentic about what they really care about. And then they can pursue those interests into a a potential career and a potential full role in society. One of the things I see, especially with my my clients who are often extremely bright, but they're struggling in the classroom setting. A lot of the kids don't even qualify for an IEP. Right, They're not impaired enough or they kind of can get by, but they're really struggling if you look just beneath the surface. Right. And, you know, their parents are scared. Sometimes it's like, if we can get them through school, we can get them into a career that'll, you know, feed that passion. And that's what they need to survive and thrive, I think. And and we miss that a lot of times. Exactly. And, you know, I talked earlier about interviewing family members of technologically very adept families uh, that had autistic kids. Um, One of the young girls in my book, when she was born her pediatrician told her parents, there is very little difference between your daughter and an animal. Wow. She just graduated college. Yeah. So there was, in fact, a lot of difference, you know. And one of the things that successive generations of parents have been learning for decades now is not to believe the most dire predictions about their children uh, and believe that their children have more potential than authorities often give them. Mm Mm-hmm. What do you think, looking forward with the neurodiversity movement and as much progress as has been made, what are some of the obstacles that you foresee? There are a couple of obstacles. One way of looking at uh, people on the spectrum, which I think has been really harmful, is to divide them into two different distinct groups, quote unquote, low functioning and quote unquote, high functioning Um, I think that's a very, very damaging and false dichotomy. Basically, if you're called low functioning, it means that your potential is disregarded and your abilities are disregarded. If you're called high functioning, it means that your struggles and challenges are disregarded. Um, And so oftentimes, even though people talk about, well, you know, neurodiversity, that's nice for the high functioning people. That is not only false, it's deadly. Sure. Because for adults who are branded high-functioning with Asperger's syndrome, there is a very high risk of suicide. And it's because they're very aware of the ways that they're being stigmatized and condemned and not fitting in and uh, not being accepted by potential friends and lovers. And so we need to get beyond false dichotomies like low-functioning, high-functioning. That's a huge obstacle. Another huge obstacle is thinking that 
autistic people don't have anything to contribute to science. And that's one of the things that I'm glad to say is changing very, very rapidly. Now at the big kind of national um, or international, really, conference of autism researchers, which is called INSAR, autistic people are going and suggesting ways that the future research could actually help autistic people now instead of only being focused on, well, it must be a genetic thing and we have to fix it because it's broken, which is what autism research was all about for about 30 years. Now, autistic people have a voice in media. So, you know, there's been a recent controversy about Sia's, you know, video with, a, uh, with uh, she, and she put down autistic actors on Twitter. Now it is as unreasonable to suggest that uh, autistic people should not be part of the conversation as it would be saying that women should not be part of the conversation about feminism. Right. You know, obviously they should be. And obviously autistic people should be part of the social conversation about autism and the future of autism research. For those of you who aren't familiar, Sia's film Music has caused some controversy because neither Sia nor the lead actor, Maddie Ziegler, are autistic. For many, it's unsettling to see a neurotypical actor portraying characteristic traits that many autistic people exhibit, especially when they are often expected by society to mask them. And for many in the autism community, telling their stories for profit while excluding them from the opportunities to self-portray is reductive and harmful. Steve Silberman wrote a book about autism, yet is himself neurotypical, but he had a frame of reference that helped him write Neurotribes. There's a tie-in from my personal life that I think really influenced the way that I um, thought about autism and, and ended up uh, framing uh, autism and neurotypes. When I was in high school, I myself was listed in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders under homosexuality. You know, I had a sexual adjustment problem but, you know, perhaps caused by a suffocating mother or some other <laughs> such thing. And I could have been put into jail or a mental asylum if I had been caught holding hands with my boyfriend in high school. When you saw discussions of homosexuality um, on television, there would be, you know, these kind of dour psychiatrists uh, talking about, uh, you know, sexual disorientation or whatever. Uh, or there would be, uh, a gay man with a hood on so that he wouldn't be fired from his job, you know, sort of confessing about his sad life. Now, obviously, well, for one thing, I'm happily married, I'm glad to say. <laughs> Homosexuality is out of the DSM. And it's not because scientists discover that, oh, homosexuality isn't a disorder after all. It's because gay psychiatrists and gay people flooded the offices of the APA and demanded that it be changed because it was simply not true that gay people were inherently disturbed. Mm -hmm. And so one of the great things that has happened since my book came out, although it's obviously not just be, you know only because of my book, <laughs> it's because my book sort of surfed this wave of social awareness that was mostly driven by autistic people speaking for themselves. Mm -hmm. Now we understand that not everything that is associated with autism is a deficit or an impairment. And we also have autistic scholars like uh, the European scholar Damien Milton, who has written about the so-called double empathy problem, which is that it's not that autistic people lack empathy. It's that autistic people and non-autistic people have trouble reading each other's emotional states. And so it's actually, it's almost more like quantum physics where you understand that the observer also influences what you find in the experiment. And we are learning that a lot of what was considered autistic deficits before was simply the inability of non-autistic researchers to make accurate judgments about what the autistic subject was feeling. That goes back to what you were talking about with high and low functioning. And I see a lot of times people talk about, well, high functioning just means that my disability doesn't impact you too much. Right, exactly. <laughs> and so and low functioning means that, you know, that that I need a lot more support from externally. And that's what people see. And that's that's who drove the narrative for a really long time. And in fact, you know, uh, one of the things that I talk about in Neurotribes 
is that uh, the early days of behavioral training of uh, autistic kids, and it was just kids at that point, uh, were brutal. Uh, It's one of the darkest chapters in American history. Prominent psychiatrists were suggesting using cattle prods at home to punish your child for climbing on a bookcase. Why did they do that? They did it because the autistic behavior embarrassed the parents in public. So if you're so concerned about being embarrassed in public that you're willing to use an electric shock device on your child, there are some really heavy-duty assumptions and judgments built into that. And thank God we've gotten past that. One of the things that autistic people do to soothe themselves and to control their own energy level is called stimming or self-stimulation. And the leading behaviorist back in the 70s, a guy named Ivar Lovas, theorized that stimming prevented learning. It was like a block, like you'd never teach a child who was stimming anything. A, that was completely wrong. It's hokum. It wasn't true, ever true. Not only that, um, when autistic people stim, they're more calm and can be more receptive. And so if you don't mind the fact that the person is waving their hands, they can learn. Hopefully the thing that people are beginning to understand, but I, again, you know, classrooms specifically, that's a problem, you know, for somebody to be pacing while I'm teaching or whatever. It's like, well, right. that's okay. They can walk back and forth. That's a self-regulating behavior. Right. You know, and you mentioned that thing with the cattle prods when the, in the 70s and, you know, and kind of mm-hmm. basically train autistic individuals to behave differently. Mm-hmm. And it's like, yes, we've made progress, but we still have a long way to go as far as ABA and beliefs and protocols that are not neurodiversity affirming, to say the least. Yes, that's true. And really the change that we're going through is that instead of thinking of um, interventions as ways of you know, correcting behavior, punishing autistic behavior, extinguishing you know, any sign of the person's actual identity, um, it's more about, or it should be more about anyway, building autonomy and independence so that the child or the young adult or the adult uh, can make their own choices and be more aware of what's happening around them and be more invested and have more agency in the decisions that will determine the future course of their lives. And that is really important. And that's something that's, you know, not just for programmers in Silicon Valley. It's uh, for people with intellectual disability as well. And one of the interesting things about that suggests that the so-called high-functioning and low-functioning dichotomy is false, is that I have seen autistic people who would be gauged as high-functioning relate intuitively really well to people who can't speak. And one of the things that people who can speak and who are also autistic can do is to articulate the concerns of people who cannot uh, or promote the use of Uh, alternative and augmentative communication devices for people who cannot speak. There's a movie that um, I don't know where the release is right now, but uh, it's called The Reason I Jump. It's based on the book uh, that became, I I believe, a bestseller uh, written by a Japanese teenager with autism who's nonverbal or non-speaking. It is a really profound film. I recommend it to everyone. It should be coming out soon in whatever, however movies come out now. (laughs) Can you imagine how your life would be if you couldn't say what you wanted? It looks at the fate of non-speaking people in different cultures, including third world countries. And the inescapable message of the film is that just because you can't speak doesn't mean you have nothing to say. I think that that is probably one of the biggest obstacles for for individuals, you know, especially maybe for parents who have a child who is non-speaking and they're not as familiar with some of the movement within the neurodiversity community because it's hard if you can't communicate with your child or don't know how to communicate with your child. If you're a parent who is challenged by, you know, what often gets called problem behavior on the part of the child. There's another book I would recommend called Uniquely Human, A Different Way of Seeing Autism by Barry Prezant. He does a a different form of intervention than ABA. It's called CERTS. Uh, And it's much more respectful of the autistic person's identity. And instead of just looking at behavior and branding it as 
uh, problematic or even just autistic. It looks at the way that the behavior of autistic uh, people, it's human behavior. They're responding to things in the environment. And that it, it seems like a subtle thing, but that's really a profound insight that instead of just branding behavior as unacceptable, that must be extinguished or whatever, you try to understand what the person is responding to in the environment. So I would very much recommend that book. It came out about a month, uh, within a month of uh, my own book, Neurotribes. And Barry Prezant and I instantly recognized that our books were sort of sister books, that my book was the history and that his book was the lessons of the history applied. I've read both of those books, and I agree that they're really great starting points for anybody if you're unfamiliar with neurodiversity and whether you're a parent or an educator or just somebody who's curious. Right. In the book, you really explain how there were kind of these these two paths that were followed, Leo Kanner and Hans Asperger, who who were very influential in how we understand autism. Can you talk a little bit just about that history and how that has influenced where we are today? Hans Asperger uh, and his colleagues, um, colleagues like George Frankel and Annie Weiss and Joseph Feldner, really discovered autism uh, in Vienna in the 1930s. They had a clinic that was an extremely humane uh, place to be. It was often a place of last resort for kids who had been kicked out of schools or sent there by the juvenile courts, etc. And uh, more than just a clinic where kids would get screening tests, uh, it was a place where kids could learn how to reintegrate themselves into society and to get along with people, as well as learning the traditional subjects like math and history and literature. Well, that sounds nice, doesn't it? Until you realize that in 1938, the Nazis marched over from Germany, over the mountains into Austria, took over Austria, took over uh, the hospital where these people were working. Uh, Asperger's Jewish colleagues, like George Frankel and Annie Weiss, had to leave so that they wouldn't get sent to a concentration camp. And not only that, Asperger's bosses became fervent Nazis. In fact, one of Asperger's mentors was a huge fan of Hitler. So one of the things that happened was that uh, the Nazis passed eugenics laws targeting people with hereditary disabilities. And even though the word autism uh, was only being used by Asperger and his colleagues, two of the categories of people who were targeted for extermination were people with epilepsy and schizophrenia. And if you think back, kids with autism would probably have been misdiagnosed or, or diagnosed in the case of epilepsy as falling into one of those two categories. So I, one of the things I talk about is that Asperger actually challenged the Nazi um, uh, discourse about hereditary disability and said, well, actually, these people could be, for instance, code breakers for the Nazis. Well, uh, the Nazis didn't go for it, but... Uh, I've heard a lot of stories over the years that a lot of the people who worked at Bletchley Park in England that broke the German Enigma codes, including Alan Turing, had autistic traits at least, if not were diagnosable. The problem is that Asperger's paper, in which he sort of stood up defending autistic people, was published in German, in a German journal, during the war, when autistic people were being exterminated. So it was not warmly embraced, shall we say, uh, in America. Um, what no one knew until uh, Neurotribes came out is that Leo Connor, who was uh, in America and who was one of the first child psychiatrists in America, he is normally credited with discovering autism because uh, in the early 1940s, he wrote kind of the definitive early paper on autism that became the human face of autism for the next many decades. Um, what no one knew is that when Leo Connor, quote unquote, discovered autism, he was working with George Frankel and Ani Weiss from Asperger's Clinic. So they helped him see what autism is. But unfortunately, he was not able to find them jobs uh, at Johns Hopkins, where he was working. So they sort of go off into other areas of life. And the concept of autism that Leo Connor developed was much more narrow. Like 
in Asperger's Clinic, they had talked about the so-called autistic continuum uh, between people who were very articulate, even very accomplished scientists, and people who couldn't speak and needed 24-7 support. Um, now, of course, we call that a spectrum. Um, Leo Connor resisted the idea of a spectrum for decades. He only admitted it years later that there was probably some kind of wide range of people within autism. And he would deny the diagnosis to people who say, had epilepsy. Well, epilepsy is very common in autism. Uh, he had this, uh, you know, rather eugenic, I have to say, idea that autistic kids are exceptionally beautiful. Well, some of them are, but some of them look more like me. <laughs> and so, you know, it's kind of like, basically, Leo kind of ruled out a lot of people who would have gotten an autism diagnosis today. And by doing so, he made it seem as if autism was very, very rare. Well, now we know it isn't. It's very common. And one of the reasons why knowing the history is important is that what hardly anyone knew until my book came out is that what really happened in the 1980s uh, was that a British cognitive psychiatrist who had a profoundly disabled autistic daughter named Susie, uh, the psychiatrist's name was Lorna Wing, she, kind of, she and her colleagues kind of slyly swapped out Connor's narrow and monolithic model for Asperger and his colleagues' more inclusive model, a spectrum model, if you will. And then all of a sudden, well, what do you know? The rates of autism diagnosis start going up. And that was actually a good thing. That's exactly what Lorna Wing had in mind by changing the criteria. But then Andrew Wakefield, you know, the now completely discredited uh, and, uh, you know, he was stripped of his medical uh, qualifications in England, came along and said, it's vaccines. That's, wh that's why the autism rates are going up. So it's really important to understand what actually happened, which I explain, you know, at length so anyone can understand it in neurotribes, um, to understand why people who are my age, I'm a baby boomer, um, or trailing edge baby boomer, they often say to me, well, how come I never heard about autism when I was a kid? Where all, where were all these people? Well, I found them, you know, and they were often not diagnosed with autism. They were diagnosed with something called childhood schizophrenia. Well, guess what? Childhood schizophrenia was considered an epidemic in the, se in the 70s and 80s. Now we understand that childhood schizophrenia in its true form is very, very rare and autism is common. It's really important so that you don't get sort of sidelined, particularly in this era when, dare I say, vaccines are going to become extremely important to all of us within the next couple of months. It's really important not to be confused about why the autism rates started going up so steeply in the 90s. There's a lot of optimism in the neurodiversity movement. What do you see as some of the next steps? What are the things you see on the horizon for autistic individuals or neurodivergent people? Some of the most important developments are uh, the seriousness of the efforts to increase uh, employment among autistic people, to build transition programs from high school to the workplace. That's huge uh, because, you know, if you can't get coaching and be introduced to uh, people who can put you on track to get a job, then you end up being dependent on your parents or society. And I had many parents tell me in the course of researching neurotribes that they were scared to die because they were worried about what would happen to their children uh, who had been dependent on them their whole lives or living with them or et cetera. And so uh, increasing autistic employment uh, is huge. I think uh, in amplifying the voices of autistic people in the cultural uh, dialogue about autism, that's something I always try to do. Um, in fact, I'm about to do another podcast with uh, Simon Baron Cohen, who is a very well-known uh, autism researcher. He has a new book. Uh, it's a fascinating book. It's called The Pattern Seekers. Uh, but before I agreed to do an online interview with him, I asked if I could have an autistic person with me to co-interview him so that she could bring up the concerns within the autistic community. And I think those are efforts that uh, really contribute to us being able to appreciate the full humanity of neurodivergent people. Steve Silberman, author of Neurotribes, 
thank you so much. Thank you so much, Emily. It's really been a pleasure. The world is beginning to open its eyes to neurodiversity. Many neurodivergent people have been hiding in plain sight for too long, and our mission is to eliminate the stigma neurodivergent people face, whether they are autistic, an adhd -er, dyslexic, gifted, twice exceptional, and that's just some of the types of neurodiversity that deserve exploration and understanding. Whether you are a new listener or you've been with us since the beginning, we are grateful to have you along for this journey. Welcome to a new neurodiverse world. I'm Emily Kircher Morris. I'll see you next time on the Neurodiversity Podcast. This has been an encore presentation of a conversation with Steve Silberman. We thank him for his time. Don't forget, the Bright and Quirky Summit 2022 is going on now through April 8th. If you get registered and hop on now, it's free, so lock out some time and join us for this important educational and uplifting summit. To register, click the link in the show notes or hop on neurodiversitypodcast.com. Our host is Emily Kircher Morris. The executive producer and post-production editor is me, Dave Morris. More episodes ahead for Autism Acceptance Month, so check your podcast feed all during the month of April. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. This is a presentation of the Neurodiversity Alliance.